Well, thank you for taking time being with us in our show today. So, tell us why why real estate? Why why did you get into real estate? Well, you know, I grew up with a lot of limiting limiting beliefs around money. Um, I heard from my parents growing up, you know, we're not the Rockefellers. Money doesn't grow on trees. You know, we can't afford that. And so I went off after college. I moved to Los Angeles, and I was starting my my career in television. And I saw Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad had come out. And I quickly identified with the poor dad version of that book, which was my dad wasn't poor, but he had that mentality around wealth building, which was the way that you make money is that you work for a nine to five job and, you know, you put a little bit of money away in savings every year and you hope to get a raise every few years. That's how you build wealth. And of course, what Robert Kiyosaki laid out in Rich Dad Poor Dad is that the opposite is true, right? That you want to build assets. You want to you want to buy assets that are going to produce cash flow for you. You're going to increase your net worth throughout your life, and you're going to retire wealthy. And you're going to hand down these this legacy wealth to to your children. So, I didn't realize it at the time. It took me a number of years to finally get it and understand it. But once I did, now that's all I focus on is buy and hold real estate. Uh, that's what I do with my company in the United States, Morris uh, Morris Invest, and that's how we help other people who are busy, you know, who work nine to five jobs. They drive two hours back and forth to work every day. They want to spend more time with their kids, and so we give them the access to real estate to be able to buy properties and have have them pr you know produce great cash flow for them. So that's why I love real estate. But do you still hold your your current position in in the network? I do. So I still work in TV. I still, you know, I like to think of it as sort of my, you know, I, I grew up loving broadcasting as a kid. I would sneak downstairs and watch Johnny Carson and David Letterman when my parents thought I was asleep. And so I love the medium of broadcasting and television and, and, and video and, and, and all of that. And so uh, I, I, would, I don't know that I would want to leave it. And uh, it's allowed me the ability to build a real estate company. It's allowed me the ability to become an investor and to spread my wings. But at the end of the day, I still love broadcasting, so I still keep that, that day job, yeah. And tell, tell us regarding your first deal. How, how did it went, went down? Well, let's see. My first deal, it was the first time I realized the power of off-market real estate. And I was living in Florida. The TV show that I worked for at the time, we moved to Florida, and I bought my first place. I bought a one-bedroom condo uh, on a golf course in Orlando, Florida. And after a few months of living there, I came to learn, or after about a year of living there, I came to learn that the woman who had lived next door to me uh, was elderly, and she passed away. Uh, she had lived there for like 30 years. I never met her, I never even saw her. Uh, her family, though, now inherited this condominium and they were going to try to sell it. They had to try to figure out what they were going to do with this condominium. Um, but it needed a ton of work. You know, it needed a ton of work. It needed to be fixed up significantly. And she had smoked for 30 years. So the walls were like covered in nicotine. <laughs> and, and, uh, and they would, the family was embarrassed to list it and sell it with a realtor. You know, um, they were going to have to probably spend fifteen, ten, fifteen thousand dollars to fix it up. And this family lived out of state. They inherited that the inherited this property. They're dealing with her estate. And I came in and I made an offer. I, I met with the family and I said, "Look, I'm interested in buying it." And I actually thought I was going to buy it and move into it. This two, it was a two bedroom condo. Mine was a one bedroom. So I thought maybe I'll fix it up and I'll move into that one. I can have my own office. You know, whatever. I was single at the time, and I started working on it. I bought the property, got a great deal. I started working on it every night. I would go over there and I'd put up, you know, I was fixing drywall and scraping off nicotine off of cabinets and painting cabinets and um, putting in new carpet and, you know, new appliances and all of that. And I decided to sell it. I listed it and sold it. I sold it like a few weeks before the market collapsed and crashed. So I made some great profit. But that was my first real sense that. I bought something off market, you know, that it, it didn't require us to go through the traditional channels. So that was my first deal. But how, how did you how did you um, get a hold of that deal? It was through a broker? How, how did you get that deal? No, so I didn't use uh, the way that it happened was my neighbor 
was considering purchasing it, and he knew that I was considering getting married soon, and so that we would want to move into a place with a little bit more space. And he said, you know, I have the phone number of the the the, the family that inherited this property. They're coming. They're coming over here, you know, tomorrow. Why don't you meet with them? And I did, and I said, look, um, I'm interested in buying this. Um, can we come? What What do you need to walk away with? You know, what What money do you need to walk away with in order to make yourselves happy? Um, and we came to an agreement. And I, at the time, I was still able to get a hundred. You know, you were able to get a hundred percent financing from banks. So I got a hundred percent financing and so <laughs> bought no, this no, property. No, no money down. No money down. Literally. literally, no money down. In fact, I even rolled the closing costs into. Yeah, the closing, you know, so or, so that I didn't even have to pay the closing costs. It was rolled into the loan. And how, how did you went about uh, from from that first one? How did you went about to building your uh, real estate portfolio that you have today? So what? How did you do the process? Well, it all started actually. So it took a few years, and I was still sort of sitting there with these limiting beliefs around money. Um, And I, I, at this point, I had reached the network in television. So I had climbed up the ladder and I was, you know, but I, I was making really good money, but I didn't have any assets. So I was putting money away in my 401k, but I, and I had some savings, but I didn't have any cash flowing assets that were producing for me. And I took a flight to New Zealand. I was on an air fl- airplane flight to New Zealand. I was going there to visit my friend who's a great photographer And I was going to go, he invited me to come to his house on the South Island and shoot photos for like five days. So on this airplane flight, 16 hour flight, this older couple in their fifties were sitting next to me. And after everyone was awake and, you know, waking up and groggy, I got to talking to them and they said, uh, you know, they said, how long are you going to be going to, uh, to New Zealand? And I said, oh, I'm going for five days to shoot some photos. And I said, how long are you guys going? And they said, we are going for two months. And I said, two months? Who gets to just go to New Zealand for two months and just tool around and have great lunches and dinners and explore? You know, who gets to do that? And he looked at me and I said, what do you do that you can go to New Zealand for two months? Aren't, doesn't a boss need you back? You know, and he said, no, no, I'm a real estate investor. I said, ah, and bells and whistles went off in my head. And I said, okay, here we come again. I, there's a reason I'm put on this flight next to these guys, okay. this, this husband and wife. And he, I picked his brain for the next hour before we landed. Where are you buying your properties? What types of properties? You know, he taught me about the Midwest. And he said, I don't buy real estate. I don't care about real estate. I don't fall in love with real estate. I fall in love with ROI and return on investment and the numbers. And he told, you know, he likes to hit it between a 10 and 12% net ROI. And and that's exactly what I do with my properties, with my company now for our investors. So the gross ROI is like over 20%. So I said, and he said, you know, people think you can't do this. You got to find off-market properties, add value to the property with a rehab, placing a great tenant in the property, and then having those assets cash flow for you and your family. And I said, okay. And I just, I as soon as I landed from New Zealand and I got back, I immediately went about trying to figure out how to do this and uh, bought my first two properties, overpaid for them, overpaid on the rehab, made some mistakes. They're still in my portfolio today, and they still produce an over 12% net ROI. Um, and I've never looked back. I've just continued to, to grow. And then I started helping clients. Um, we had fa- My mom was my first client. She came to me and said, hey, I've got $40,000 to invest. Can you help me buy a property? And I said, sure. And she said, by the way, you're going to have to do everything for me because I don't know how to renovate a house and rehab it. And I said, no, no, my team will do it. I had already been building my team, my team of contractors, my property management team, my head of acquisitions. All of those things were coming together, and it took a number of years to do it. We renovated my mom's property, got it up and running and rented with a great te- great tenant in the property. And that was like you know, six, seven years ago now. So, but this is this, these properties that you are talking about. These are all multi-families, right? No, single families. Oh, single families. So, okay. yeah. Although my mom has a duplex, so we do a few uh, multi-families. We'll do a few duplexes, a few triplexes, a few quads, but mostly my bread and butter with my company are single-family 
you know, three bedroom, two bath, three bedroom, one bath, um, two bedroom, one bath. And, you know, with a nice driveway, sometimes a garage, you know, your own backyard. And those, I love, I love single families. I always have, I grew up in a single family house. So I know what that feels like for a tenant to come home at the end of the day from, from a job to know that you've got your own house, you know, your own yard, your own roof. Um, if you want to have a dog, great. They've got a yard to run around in. There's something psychological about feeling like it's your own house. Uh, and you, you don't have that when you have a multifamily, in my opinion. But, but um, when you are, if you are speaking from a deal perspective, um, if the guy leaves, you, you're pretty much in a hole, right? Because you now have a liability because you don't have any, anyone paying for the mortgage. So why do you decide to go uh, to SFRs when pretty much, when I speak to investors, pretty much multifamilies, pretty much I always kind of the pretty lady of the investment world. It is, but here's the thing with multifamilies. I think it's multifamilies on paper look better than single families okay. on paper. But when you get out into the real world, single family homes tend to stay rented longer and with less turnover than multifamilies. It's just a fact. Um, and people who own a lot of multifamilies try to incentivize tenants to stay longer with different gimmicks. Look, if you've got a 10 unit apartment complex, I guarantee you one of your units is vacant right now. Um, so on paper, it's going to always look better. Your ROI is going to look better. But in, in, in actual practice, it's not necessarily the case. Now, that is not to say, let's say we had a duplex and you have a duplex with three bedrooms, three large bedrooms and two bathrooms on each side, right? So that the duplex kind of looks like a single family home, right? You've got many, many bedrooms that are large and it kind of, then it kind of mimics a single family home. And then you tend to have tenants that want to stay longer, want to nest, you know, want to put down some roots and stay in this house for five years, six years, seven years. But those small multifamilies, the one bedrooms that are real small, Those tend to act more like efficiency apartments with a lot of turnover. It's just a fact. And so I don't want turnover. I want consistency. And I'd rather have a tenant sign a five-year lease than have to every year do a one-month tenant turnover where I've got to get in there and update the carpet, and paint, and do those types of things. I'd rather you know, maybe lose money by not being able to increase rent then lose money by every year having to pay to paint and carpet and touch up things because this tenant keeps moving out all the time. And how many, how many SFRs do you have so far? Uh, how, how's the size of your portfolio? Yeah, we have, I think, right around 50 now in my personal portfolio. Um, and we do, for my company, we do about 40 to 50 houses a month. We renovate about 40 to 50 houses a month for our clients. Um, and so it really just comes down to capital for my wife and I. We try to buy them all free and clear. We try to do all of them cash um, or, you know, using a home equity line of credit or some other um, cash tool, uh, borrowing from our 401k or unlocking some of our retirement funds to be able to do it. But I like to have all of those houses free of debt. Um, and so when we have enough capital to buy our next one, you know, we, my wife comes to me and she says, Okay, we have we have about forty five thousand in savings. Time to grab another property, and then we we grab one. Hearing you talking about about this and uh, trying to understand your perspective makes sense that you are looking for kind of a higher class, higher bracket uh, tenants, because you would have a, a lower turnover if, if these are people that have like steady incomes and take care of your property. So these are B plus properties. Actually, my bread and butter are C and B class neighborhoods. Okay. So where I do my properties are areas where we have tenants who I do want to stay a long time. I mean, I've got tenants that have like, we'll sign five-year leases. Um, they're the nurses at the local hospital. We just signed a, uh, a lease with a, a postal employee. He's been, or she has, excuse me, she's been with the U.S. Postal Service for 17 years, single mom. She wanted to be in the school district where our property is located. And she said she wants to be there for a long time. She wants to be in that school district where her daughter can grow up, right? Um, 
our tenants work at the local, you know, the local hospitals, the local post office, the local Amazon distribution center, the, um, the, the local Raytheon factories, the, the local GM factories. Um, they are a lot of them American based jobs that aren't going to go to China or Mexico. They're, uh, you know, the jobs are because of where we buy our properties are not in a one um, a one horse town. And what I mean by that is we're not buying our properties next to the one Air Force base. That's the only reason that town exists. Right. And what happens if that Air Force base closes down? Then you're screwed. Right. Then those you can't you're not gonna be able to rent properties because everyone just moved or the one major Walmart distribution center, and that's the only job source in town. What happens if Walmart closes that place down? So I don't buy in places like that. I buy near, you know, I'm in the Midwest, and I'm near multiple places like a FedEx distribution hub, a FedEx hub, where that's not going to China. Like that main distribution hub is the crossroads of the country and where all of those trucks and airplanes come out of. A lot of our tenants work there. And so, again, American-based solid jobs where even during the recession, even during the collapse, the people that own properties in the neighborhoods where we buy didn't see a dip in their rental income at all. Yeah, they saw a dip in value. You know, the house, instead of it being worth forty-five, maybe dipped down to thirty or 35000 But that's okay because they're holding it for the rest of their life and they're only focused on cash flow. So those neighborhoods have been great for me. Those are the bread and butter of my neighborhoods. I, I sometimes will buy a B-plus property to mix into my portfolio, but for the most part, I love C-class properties. They are very few moving parts. We don't have garage door openers. I don't have garbage disposals. I don't have – I don't even buy appliances. My tenants buy all their own appliances. So that includes a stove refrigerators, washers and dryers, tenants, if they want them, they purchase them and then they own those appliances through a local uh, dealer and they take them, if they move in five years, they take them with them. Uh, I heard you talk about the, um, the type of neighborhood. So these, these are people, um, blue, blue collar type of workers. Mm -hmm. what, what I wanted to understand is regarding the deal flow, how many units uh, do you kind of uh, assess on paper before you actually decide to pull the trigger on one deal that looks, looks uh, right to, to do? Well, because I'm fortunate that my company, I have my head of acquisitions, you know, we're, we're buying properties every week. We just bought a package of 20 properties, you know, that need all sorts of rehab and fixing up, right? So we'll buy, we go through that list and we'll look and see like, okay, these are the 20 that we're buying. And great, my wife will come to me and say, "Hey, honey, we're we're ready to buy another property." So I'll just grab one of the nine, you know, one of the twenty, and there's nineteen left for for my investors, you know. So it's we're we're buying in those same zip codes over and over and over again. I know exactly the streets that we buy on a regular basis. So it's not I'm not just randomly picking properties across the country. We're, my team is located. We're in the same zip codes that where we consistently buy our properties. I, there's been whole streets that I've rebuilt, you know, where, you know, one, two, three main street is, is, has been rehabbed right next to one, two, five main street next to the other ones right down the street that we've rehabbed over the years. So we know the ins and outs of these exact streets. We know exactly how much our properties will rent for. And we're always spot on with that. We know exactly what it will cost to fix it up, you know? But when, um, when, when you are saying 20, 20 properties, are you bulk buying these 20 properties or from the, these 20 best cases, you are just choosing one to buy? Oh, no, we'll buy because we are rehabbing as a company, Morris Invest, for our clients. We rehab anywhere from, you know, 40 to 50 properties over a, like a, a month to two month period. So we're constantly in buying mode where we'll buy a big package of properties from a failed hedge fund that went under from, you know, just a big package of properties that are at the tax, you know, that have tax liens on them that all kinds of problems, you know, foreclosures, although those have really kind of dried up. Um, so we'll buy them and we'll then assign our contracting crews to start the rehab on those and rotate, you know, roof on this one, windows on that one. And then the crews are bouncing back and forth with, between the different properties, plumbing in that one, updated electrical there and bouncing around until we get them up and running and they're, they're great rental properties. We get them leased up with our tenants and 
off to the races. But, but these are these are brokers that, that are sending you deals or pretty much you have a, a team on place that kind of goes uh, driving for dollars? Yeah, we have a team in place, our acquisition, our acquisitions team, and we don't really don't pick up one-off properties. Uh, we, we have wholesalers that will send us properties all the time. Um, look, wholesaling was like the foundation of everything that I learned and started doing in real estate, so I, I have an affinity for wholesaling, but um, when wholesalers send us deals, I, I just kind of chuckle because I'll look at the deal that comes in our inbox and it's always – you know, fifteen thousand dollars more than what I could buy it for. Um, you know, the same type of house. So I, I just pass on it because that's not something that we we want to waste our time with. Um, you know, I'd be able to work with wholesalers if they would come to us with reasonable numbers, right? I, if I found a wholesaler that I could work with who would be able to bring me consistent deals, but not try to make a ton of money on every property. I mean, at the end of the day, these houses that we sell to our investors are like going to be all in total cost, like forty, forty-five thousand dollars. So, do you think there's going to be a, you know, a huge margin for a wholesaler to be in in the middle of that transaction? Not, no, not really. So, if that person was reasonable and could make just a thousand, you know, like a finder's fee per property, then I would I'd be happy to work with that person for years to come. But instead, everyone wants to be greedy, and I don't. I want to keep the numbers low enough for our investors that I work with them for ten properties, fifteen properties. You know, we have a lot of international investors, so I can think of Chris, who is one of our. You know, he's in Switzerland. He just bought like twelve properties with us. Um, but if I charged a ridiculous amount for one property, then he wouldn't buy 12. You know, I'd rather work with someone to help them build a portfolio than work with them for one property and never hear from them again, you know? That, that was, this was exactly my, my next question, because um, as you know, we build this channel to help our European listeners and investors to, to go into the US and start, start uh, pulling the trigger, so to speak. But if you live in the middle of nowhere and you don't know the difference between street A and street B, you, you kind of need everything in life is possible. Nothing is impossible. It's just a matter of looking at things and saying, how can it be done? But this is a huge hurdle because you don't know anything. You just don't know something quite simple as looking at the difference between street A and street B. So how would you advise someone that is in their shoes to, to go about and doing it? Well, you can spend five years in analysis paralysis. You know, <laughs> you can spend 10 years trying to learn every neighborhood in these potential cities. But I can tell you after my flight to New Zealand and I was listening to these this expert real estate investor where he was investing in the Midwest, he told me the towns where he was and I said, great. And I got back and I didn't even think twice about it. I just bought two properties. And yeah, I paid a little bit more than I should have. And I spent, you know, I, I bought appliances. I, I over upgraded that house, you know, fine. That doesn't mean I'm going to get a higher return from my tenants because I added a few extra little things to the property. I just wasted money, frankly. But you learn it, you know, you live and learn. So you could sit there for five years and never take action and try to just learn and learn and learn. Or you can put your faith in like somebody who, who does it for a living. So, I mean, that's what I do, right? It's like that's, I'm in these specific zip codes. With my team, I have three offices in these specific zip codes because those are the only zip codes that we work in for a reason because we can get a high ROI. We consistently keep a very low vacancy rate, like below 5%. Our properties stay rented consistently. We partner with the local public hospitals. If they need one or two bedroom apartments, we immediately get them filled with tenants. So we have it down to a science. And so you can really overanalyze and try to do it all yourself, or you can put your faith in someone who already does it and does it consistently. Um, and I had a guest on our podcast recently, and uh, she's, she's an investor from Canada. And she said, you know, my advice to new investors is, what's the worst that can happen, right? Okay, so you buy a property, it can never go down to zero dollars in value like a stock, right? So now you own a piece of property, like my first property. I overpaid for it a little bit. But if the ROI is there, if the return on investment, if the numbers are strong and sound, and you're getting between a 10 and 12% net ROI on the property, what do? what's the worst that could go wrong? The house burns down? Yeah, then you have insurance, right? What's the worst that could go wrong? 
it's vacant for a few weeks, longer than you would like, okay. But really, at the end of the day, what is the worst that could go wrong? Um, you know, so I, I think that's my advice to those people who are kind of just sitting on the fence. You know, you can sit on the fence for the next five years. And do, doing this, so let's say we have, we have some of our listeners that after this show that they contact you and say, Morris, this is great, so let, let's do this. Let's, let's start. So how does this run us through the process, the typical process to get someone that is interested in actually going about and pretty much doing this with you? Right. So what we do is, you know, we take people through this process. It's very, very simple. And when someone books a call with our team, they we want to find out what their freedom number looks like. Right. We want to find out what their financial freedom number is and what, what does that mean? So when people go to our website, we have a, a free download, a cheat sheet. It's three pages long and we want people to figure out how many properties it would take for them to achieve financial freedom. So the very first question we ask when we get on the phone with someone is, what's your freedom number? And so you can download it, just morrisinvest.com slash freedom. And you sit down and it teaches you to look at your monthly expenses. And then it teaches you to reverse engineer how many properties it would take for you to achieve, have all of those expenses covered. Is it 10 properties? Is it five properties? So one of the first things we'll do when we get on the phone, you click on the schedule a consultation button, you pick a 30 minute time slot, and I've got five team members, myself included, we'll get on the phone and we'll talk with you about your goals financially and how many properties you'd like to achieve and, and, and acquire. And we'll say, what is your freedom number? And they'll say, you know, 10. I only need 10 properties. Some people it's 20 because they've got five kids, you know, and, uh, um, or they live in a really expensive town, you know, and so it's more expensive for them. Like we have some investors from London, you know, and so it's really expensive to live in London. So their their freedom number is going to be higher. And then we see if it's a fit for them. We let them know a little bit about what we do, how we renovate our properties. We make them into bulletproof houses so they don't have to have repairs to worry about for 10 to 15 years. Um, and if we have a property available, we send it over to them and they say, great, I'll take it. And the next question out of our mouths is, great, um, what name do you want on title? You know, are you buying this in an LLC? Are you setting up, do you have your, you're buying it in your own name? And if they're a foreign investor, you know, do you have those pieces to help you set up a, an American bank account in order to receive the rent into that account? We help them with that. Uh, we have team members on our team that can help them set up their LLC or their business entity in the United States. Um, and then also set up their, their bank account so that when rent checks come in, they go into that account. Um, there's just a few more little ho hoops and hurdles that, that international investors have to jump over in order to uh, be able to invest in the United States. And there, there are any, any kind of sorts of legal or fiscal issues that you would advise for, for a foreign investor to, to be extra careful with? Well, I like to say, look, I am not a financial advisor. I'm not an attorney, so I don't offer financial advice. Uh, that's not something that I do, but I will point them in the right direction. So we have a team member that we work with that helps foreign investors get set up um, with their bank accounts and get the proper entity set up. For instance, we have Canadian investors, right? They don't want to set up a limited liability corporation. They set up a C corporation because the legal protections for them as a Canadian investor a C corporation makes sense for them legally. Um, I don't know all, you know, for every different country, what is the best legal entity to set up in the United States. But I would think that given the fact that Canada, if you're a Canadian investor buying in the United States, a C corporation offers a level of protection above an LLC. Um, I would imagine the same would be true if you're in Spain or Portugal or, you know what I mean? Setting up a similar structure in order to protect yourself. So, you need to make sure you're speaking to your local financial advisors and accountants in your country and then working with an expert in the United States sort of in tandem to set up those things. It is a little bit more difficult, but it shouldn't be that difficult that you prevent yourself from taking action and becoming a real estate investor. I mean, the benefits of owning real estate in the United States just far outweighs any other area of investment in the world. And we see it across the board. I mean, I have, you know, New Zealand investors, I have Australian investors. They're trying to buy the same single family home that I can do for 40, 45, 50,000. 
they're they'd have to pay three hundred and fifty thousand, you know, in in Australia for the same structure and same house. So, but we try to take care of people to help them on that path. Mark, we talked about the freedom number. If if you don't know what that is, you can go on BP and watch the interview that Moise gave. It was pretty enlightening regarding what that is. It's you just ask yourself what is it that you need in order to be safe and sound, and then reverse engineering the number of units that you need and start taking action. So what I what I wanted to know is since you obviously, <laughs> at least from my perspective, you hit your freedom number. Uh, what's next for you? Where do you see yourself in the next the next five years? Well, we just published a book. My wife and I just published a book called How to Pay Off Your Mortgage in Five Years or Less. Um, I think we're, we're, we're looking to double the size of the company and really expand, put those extra customer service pieces in place with the right employees. So we're, you know, we're always going to be there for our clients and helping them grow their portfolio. I want to double the size of the company, uh, both internally and externally. Uh, and making sure quality control is even accelerated. But I also, we're, we're looking at a, doing a number of things where I'm going to be going around internationally and nationally speaking, um, helping people build and get out of their limiting beliefs around money. So speaking in front of different groups. Uh, I may even be starting an academy that can help people on financial freedom, something I've been looking at. So I think just continuing in this, I, I really... I like to think I'm not really a real estate investor as I am helping people sort of overcome their limiting beliefs around money. Uh, I suffered from it as a kid, how, you know, these negative associations with money and wealth building. And I want people to break that uh, and come outside of that mold and help, and help as many people as I can uh, become wealthy and build passive income that they can make sure they can pass on to their children. I think, I think in, uh, in truth, you feel you feel different when you when you live in the uh, when you look at things in a way that you are giving. And I know that there's a lot of people like Tony Robbins and all those sorts of motivators, and that's great. But you you need a plan, right? Because otherwise you go to these motivation right. meetings, and afterwards on Monday, and there we go again. Because you need <laughs> you need an, right. like, but you need an actual plan to you need a plan, right? Yeah. right. But. Uh, the reality is even small gestures when you, let's say, you teach someone something. Because I, I see sometimes that we tend to undervalue some of the things that we know. And s sometimes you come across with someone that is kind of struggling with something. It might be something simple for you. And you just didn't get it yet. So the, the act of you uh, daily sharing uh, advice and something that you know and truly passionate about you never know when you actually can come across someone and actually help them to achieve something. And I think that's great. And I think you should go forward with your academy. I think it would be wonderful to have people um, learn from, from your experiences. Anyway, I, lo I love reading. I'm, I'm a bookworm, and I like to, to know uh, what are the, your latest reads and the latest books that you would recommend our listeners to know. You know, I just reread a book called The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. Now, Michael Singer is a billionaire, but you wouldn't know that when you open the book. You wouldn't know that at the beginning of the book, and only if you researched him would you find out what an amazing human being Michael is. His book is called The Surrender Experiment, and he talks about surrendering throughout his career to things instead of fighting against things. Um, for instance, he owned a track of land in Florida where he wanted to open sort of a meditation retreat. And a woman just like showed up on his land and started building a house. And instead of fighting with her legally and otherwise, he ended up embracing this new relationship and it ended up changing his life. Um, business opportunities that just sort of come out of nowhere and just kind of open up to him. But the whole book, you, you won't believe the stuff that he goes through. And you're saying to yourself, really? How did he go through this? He lost everything and he and he didn't fight it. And now he's a billionaire because he didn't fight it. I mean, you have to go through this book. It really is a life-changing way of looking at the world and the universe and just being aware of the signs that present themselves to you 
because when they do, you might have just stumbled across this video, you know, in, in your in your feed, in your YouTube feed. You might not have ever been thinking about real estate investing before, but you've been lately thinking about changing your life. Well, maybe this video showed up for you at a, at a moment because the universe wanted it to. It wanted to put this in front of you. You know, like and being aware of those signs, things don't just happen coincidentally. Uh, there is no such thing as coincidence. So I, that book is a really powerful book. I've had a couple of my entrepreneurial friends who are now reading it, and they're just calling me up. They're like, "This book's amazing! I can't believe it. This guy's this. I can't believe this." So, check it out. The Surrender Experiment. I think it um, might oh, might wow. make you think. Uh, I will. Mark, there's any, any anything else that we haven't covered yet that you think it's really important for our European listeners to know? No, I my well my biggest thing is don't let borders keep you from taking action. We've at my company have worked with a lot of international investors and I worked with one investor out of uh the United Kingdom. He had he he had uh he had no money, he had no experience and I said, "Great, give us a call." And he's now about to close on his first property. We got him set up with his LLC or his uh, his business entity he was able to find and line up private financing at a local real estate group in in london he now is about to close on his first property and this guy had no experience no money nothing and he lived in the uk and he's now closing on his first property so if he can do it anybody can do it okay it was a pleasure having you on on board with us today so thank you for taking time doing uh, doing this uh, show Where can, our, where can our listeners get a hold of you? Well, the best way is just go to my website. Morris is my last name, M-O-R-R-I-S, morrisinvest.com. Download the cheat sheet. It's free. Download it at morrisinvest.com slash freedom. Email us. Book a call with us. We'd love to talk with you. And I, I, I'm always very active on social media. Um, you know, I've got our whole YouTube channel as well, our Morris Invest YouTube channel. So follow me there and, and email us, interact with us, and we'll get right back to you and email you too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Okay.